Good evening, everyone. We've had a glorious time here at the Witness Conference, haven't we? How many of us can truly say this evening that we were blessed as a result of being here? Praise the Lord. I know I have been blessed and my spiritual walk with the Lord have been enriched and my soul have been encouraged because of your faith, your participation, your words of encouragement, the messages by the various speakers, the presentations that were presented, all of it worked together to give us a renewed sense of who we are, whose we are, and what we're about. Amen? And I know that we're going to leave here tonight taking with us all of the blessings of this experience, and we are going to go out and do something wonderful for the Lord. Amen? God has truly been good to us. And I just want to thank God for His continued goodness and mercy towards me and what I see He's doing in the life of each and every one of you. Tonight, as we begin this final message tonight, I want to ask you to bow your heads with me as we seek God in prayer. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, tonight, we want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for the privilege that is ours to be a part of this wonderful experience of this witness conference. Father, we have learned things new and old. We have been encouraged. Our souls have been revived. And Father, we pray tonight that you will bless us as we again open your word. Help us, O oh God, to not be hearers only, but to be doers of the word. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening I've entitled the message, Stand Up and be counted. Stand up and be counted. I don't know what life is truly like here for you on a day-to-day -day basis. I haven't been here long enough on this trip to really observe some of the things that I would normally be able to observe, but I can tell you from my experience living in the United States, looking at what is happening in the news, looking at what is going on in our lives, in the church and without the church, here's what I've discovered. That everything and everyone that was in the closet has come out except us. <laughs> there are still too many of us who name the name of Jesus Christ that are still hiding in the closet. And Jesus is looking for us to stand up and be counted. He's looking for people who are willing to say, yes, I'm a child of the king. Yes, I'm a son of God. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'll never forget many years ago, and some of you probably weren't even born yet, but there was a very uh, well-known television uh, program in the United States, and the moderator or the host was a man named Phil Donahue. And Phil Donahue interviewed one of the prominent preachers. He's dead now. And uh, this particular uh, preacher, he asked him, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? And my brothers and sisters, I sat there with some fear and trepidation as to what this preacher was going to say. And he danced all around the question. And my brothers and sisters, I sat there with great disappointment because this man had built a, a university in Virginia. This man was a man who had led many people to the Lord. And yet and still, when he was confronted with a question, is Jesus Christ the only way? But the way that the host phrased the question, it put him on the spot. He said, you mean to tell me that unless I accept Jesus Christ, unless I believe in Jesus Christ, that I can't make it to heaven? The answer to the question should have been categorically, yes. That's what the Bible says. Jesus did not say, I am one of the ways. Jesus said, I am the only way. And brothers and sisters, tonight we need not be apologetic for standing up for what the Bible says and what the Lord himself declares. And so tonight I want to share with you a message on the subject, stand up and be counted. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to the third chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. 
It is a well-known and very, very popular Bible story, and most of us, at some part, place in our journey, have read this story and studied this story. And yet and still, I believe that there is so much here for us that we can read it over and over and over, and each time that we read this passage, God has fresh insights and helps to deepen our convictions and help to clarify what we are here for. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 3 about three men who were faced with a challenge that most of us in our lifetime will not have to face. The Bible tells us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought to Babylon as slaves. Nebuchadnezzar had gone up to Jerusalem and conquered the people and brought them back to Babylon. From among those who had been taken captive, Nebuchadnezzar sought out the best and the brightest to train them and utilize them in his service. Among them was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When we study the prior two verses, uh, chapters rather, here's what we discover in chapter 1. From the very outset that we encounter Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were faced with challenges and faced with choices. Each and every one of us, each and every waking moment of each and every day, we are faced with challenges and we are also faced with choices. In chapter 1, we, are, we read the story about them being asked to partake of the king's table. And the Bible tells us they refused to eat from the king's table because what was prepared and presented before them was not in harmony and in keeping with what they were taught from the word of God as to what should go into their bodies. And you know the story, they requested time to pray and to seek God. And then they asked the king for a simple diet, and God honored their faith and trust in him. And the Bible tells us that at the end of 10 days, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in much better spiritual and physical condition than those who had partaken of the king's food. In chapter 2, the Bible tells us another crisis. It seems that in the life of these men of God, one crisis followed the other. In chapter 2, the king had a dream that he could not remember or recall. It so disturbed the king that the Bible tells us he called for all of the wise men in the realm to come and not only tell him the interpretation, but to tell him the very dream. And we know what the dream unfolded. God, in his wisdom and mercy, was giving to Nebuchadnezzar a sort of a glimpse into the future. God was showing him his place in history. But just as it was then, so it is now. That many of us find ourselves in a state of discontent with where God has seen fit to place us. I see this unfolding sometimes in the church. People want to be in certain offices that God has not gifted them to be in. Have you ever run into an usher who should not be at the door? An usher who is having a bad day? There are some people that are not cut out. Their temperament, their personalities, their disposition does not recommend them to be a greeter or an usher. Yet they want to be there and sometimes we have to lovingly tell them. Hello. Hello. God, in his wisdom and mercy, gave Nebuchadnezzar a, a glimpse into the future. And in the dream, God showed him the successive nation that would rise and fall and his place. God said to him in this gold, this image that was set up in his dream, made up of the various metals, the head of it being gold, and God says, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. And one would think that if God was, in his wisdom, was to designate you as the head, that would be satisfactory. But Nebuchadnezzar was not satisfied because he discerned that each of the succeeding medals depicted kingdoms that would come after his kingdom. What it said to Nebuchadnezzar was that as important as you are, and as brilliant as you are, and significant as you are, you will not be here forever. There's a lesson in that for some of us church members and church leaders. The church will go on. 
with or without us. All of us are here for a time to serve in a place of God's choosing. But please let us never get to the place where we believe that somehow we are indispensable to God. God will use us, but there comes a time when God will say, you have done your part, and it's time for others to come up on the scene and do what God has instructed them to do. Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar's discontent with God led to disobedience to God. Disobedience springs from a heart that is discontent with the ways and the will of God. And so in defiance of God's revelation to him, the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar then made an image of pure gold and set it up and then commanded the people to come to the place at a designated time to bow down and worship the golden image. Now I know what some of us are saying right about now. If I was there... <laughs> I would be standing right next to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's easy for us to say that now. It's easy for us to look back, knowing the outcome of the story, and make that bold declaration. And yet and still in our world today, and even in our church, I've been out with church members to restaurants. And people who you would not think would be hesitant to say a prayer over their food, they're hesitant. Because somehow in that public arena, somehow in that public setting, they find it difficult to express their faith and trust in God for the food that they're about to eat. Matter of fact, when you go to some restaurants, you had better pray before you eat. <laughs> Hello. Amen. Because the chances are, there are times and places you really don't know what's in that plate. And it just may be that that prayer that you have prayed is what makes the difference between you walking out and you being carried out. <laughs> and so the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar set up the time and the place. He set up the occasion and he orchestrated. And he says that when the music sounded, he said, I want everybody to bow down and worship the golden image. The Bible tells us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being watched and observed. And I want to tell you today, my brothers and sisters, that those of us who name the name of Jesus Christ, we are being watched and we are being observed. Your co-workers and your neighbors and your friends, they're watching you and they're taking note. And the first time you slip up, here's what they're going to say, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were a child of God. I know you were phony. I know you didn't mean what you were saying all this time. We are being watched, not only by our friends, but we are being watched by the universe. Because you and I, we are on trial for God. God, as it were, is on trial within us. And people are watching to see what we will do. The Bible tells us that when the music was sounded, that everyone bowed down. Now, please understand that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not the only Jews present that day. But the Bible tells us that when the crisis came, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood tall. Why? Because they had a relationship with God. Now, my brothers and sisters, there is something here that's also important for us to note right now. The Bible tells us that those who were watching Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went back to the king and reported what they had seen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing tall, standing up and being counted as those who are children of God. Can I tell you right now that crisis does not create character. Crisis reveals character. It's easy for us to say, oh, how I love Jesus. It's easy for us to talk about how good God is and how much we love God. But when we are faced with a crisis, the crisis does not create character. Crisis reveals character. It shows what we are and whose we are. But watch what happens now. This is instructive. The Bible tells us, that those men who were jealous, those men who were envious that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
who were brought there as captives and were promoted above themselves and had, had enjoyed the favor of the king, now they thought they had something on them and they hastened back to Nebuchadnezzar with the news. Nebuchadnezzar, guess what? Those three Adventist young men that you promoted, they are ungrateful, unthankful, and unfit. They refuse to bow down. But here is the lesson. Here is the lesson that we as Christians need to learn from this instant. The Bible tells us this heathen king, Nebuchadnezzar, did not take the word of these men who brought the news. He did not go along with the gossip. He called them in and asked them for himself. Is it so? There's a lesson for church members here. Quite often we hear rumors floating around the church. And we are not interested in whether or not it's true. We are only interested in whether or not it's juicy. <laughs> Hello. So the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king, demonstrated more character in that moment because he called them in for himself to find out, is this so? There are people who are hurting in the church because of gossip. There are people who are walked, have walked away from the church because of lips that could not be controlled and tongues that were moving when it should not have been moving and words that were spoken when prayer should have been uttered. The Bible tells us Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego appeared before the king and they said, King, listen, we, we don't mean to embarrass you. We are not at all ungrateful. We know what you have done for us and we appreciate it, but we can't go along. The Bible says we ought to obey the laws of man as long as and until they conflict with the laws of God. I want you to understand today, my brothers and sisters, that this story that we often read and so glibly rush through is a window through which we can see what's coming. If we understand what this church teaches and believes, that there is coming a day, and what the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, that there's going to come a time when all of us will have to make a choice to receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God, and it will surround the same issue that is being challenged here in Daniel chapter 3, the law of God. Just as we know that a day will be set... When a death decree is to be issued, we see it right here in this third chapter of Daniel. The last day events that will culminate in the very near future that will involve many of us here tonight, those events have already been played out here in Daniel chapter 3. The law of God, again, is at the center of the controversy. So the king says, I'll give you a second chance. Can we give Nebuchadnezzar a little hand clap right now? Come on, help me out right now. Give him a little hand. Give Nebuchadnezzar a hand. Why? Because at least Nebuchadnezzar was willing to give them a second chance. How often in the church we fail to give each other a second chance? How often in the church we slip one time, we make one mistake, one fault, and we're through. You might, as well, you might as well head to Hallelujah Hill and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, all by yourself because you're finished down here. You're done. One mistake. But here is a heathen king that was willing to give them a second chance. Aren't you glad tonight that we serve a God who gives us second chances over and over and over again? How is it that we can't give each other a second chance? How is it that we are so willing to say, Lord, I hope they get what they deserve. What if God gives us what we deserve? The Bible tells us, and here's where the story gets real good. Look at what it says in verse 17. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 16, it says, we are not careful to answer you in this manner. Look at verse 17, Daniel chapter 3. This is where it really gets good. If it be so, and what's the next word, everybody? No, no, no. What's the next word? Not the next two words. What's the next word? Our. Our God. Our God. 
It speaks of a personal relationship that these three young men had with God. Not instant religion because of a crisis. Not declaring who we are in the moment. But they're speaking of a relationship that had been long established. Our God. Is God your God? Or is God your mother's God? Or your daddy's God? Or your wife's God? Or your husband's God? Is God your God? The only way that we are going to be able and enabled to stand up and be counted is when we have a personal connection, a personal relationship with God for ourselves. Our God whom we serve. Not a God that we sing about. Not a God that we read about. Not a God that we see in church once a week. Not a God that we see three times throughout our life. You know, there's some people who only go to church. Go to church three times in their lives when they're hatched, matched, and dispatched. <laughs> three times. Yeah. But listen to what the Bible says. Our God whom we serve. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you serve him? Or do you just know about him? You see, there is a qualitative difference between knowing God and knowing about God. Knowing about God will get you the praise and accolades of men. But that won't get you through the crises. That will not enable you and empower you to get through those moments when all hell breaks loose and you're confronted with the enemy. You got to know him. And the only way to know him is day by day, spend some time with God. There's a song that says, Speak oft with your God. And friends of mine, I can tell you tonight, it's, it doesn't just happen. This kind of relationship that is necessary to face this kind of crisis and come through it is a relationship that is forged in personal, intentional devotion. Knowing God for yourself. Spending time with God in your own prayer closet. Crying out to God. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, not my pastor, not my elder, not my deacon. But it's me. It's me, it's me, oh Lord. When we pour out our soul with that kind of intensity, the Spirit of God comes upon us and enables us and equips us to face the challenges that we are all going to face sooner or later. But listen to what the Bible says. We're still in verse 17. Our God, whom we serve, is able. Do you know that God is able? Do you really believe that God is able? You see, if we really believe that God is able, we, there is no place for worry in our lives. I shared with the, the group that I did the first seminar with something I read about worry. It says that worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. Yeah. And yet we spend so much time worrying. Our God is able. How did, they, how did they know that God was able? How did they know? Do you think they remember the story about what God did in Egypt? Do you think for a moment that maybe it's what they heard about what God did at the Red Sea? God is able. Where did they get that from? They were taught about how God had led in the past. Doesn't Ellen White say the only fear that we have for the future is as we forget the way God has what? Led us in the past. If we remember what God has done before, and we know that he's the same yesterday, he's the same today, he'll be the same tomorrow. Why do we worry about what the future brings? The same God who brought us through all of the crises before, that same God is able and available. They said that God is able. <laughs> we knew what he did for Moses, and we know what he did for Abraham, and we knew what he did at Jericho. We know all of that, so we know God is able. But here's where their faith really shines through. 
Here's what they said. But if not. But if not. What happens to us? What happens in us? When God often will move in ways contrary to our expectations. What do we do when we pray and we fast and we pray and we fast and somehow it seems that God is in some distant remote part of the universe and he's unconcerned and unconnected with what we are dealing with right now. What do we do then? Do we still say that God is able? Or do we throw our Bibles on the shelf and say, I'm not going back to church anymore. All that religion stuff doesn't make it mean a thing. Oh, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you something about faith that I've discovered that has been helpful to me. Faith is believing and behaving consistent with the Word of God. Real faith, godly faith, Spirit-inspired faith believes and trusts God in the face of contrary evidence. Real faith enables us to overcome facts. Mm, you, you, that's going to kind of make sense to you around Tuesday. You may not get it right now, but stick around. Around Tuesday, he said, oh, oh, oh that, that's what he meant. And it's right there in the Bible. Elijah, the preacher, showed up, and the woman is about to have a last meal. And just like a pastor, he says, go in there and make a bread for me first. And God says, that little bit of oil and little meal will not diminish until the famine is over. Her faith overcame the facts. You see, when you're a child of God, the facts may be contrary. But because you serve a God who transcends facts when we put our faith into operation. So the Bible tells us, they cried out, our God is able. <laughs> but even if he chooses to move in a way that we think he should, we're going to remain confident in knowing he's working all together for our good. Faith, trusting God in the face of contrary evidence. Faith is trusting God in spite of the circumstance. And faith is trusting God in spite of the consequence. Our God is able. What I try to tell people is, listen, there are things that are going to happen in your life if you love the Lord and if you're serving God. There are circumstances that are going to take place in your life that, that logic and reason will not give you a rational explanation. So what do you do? What do you do when God is silent? What do you do when God does move? Here's what I do. I go right back to the cross. I go back to what I already know. I go back to what is firmly established. I go back to that which is incontrovertible. I go back to what I was taught as a little boy. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. So I can look at the facts, and my faith in God helps me to overcome and get over and get past the facts. Why? Because Jesus loves me. When I don't know what he's doing now, I go back to what I know he's already done. And I wait right there until the way clears up before me. This is what the Bible says. Our God is able. But if he doesn't deliver us, that's all right. That's okay. Paul says it's a little different. He says, whether I live or die, God be praised. That kind of faith, that kind of confidence 
doesn't happen just showing up at church one day a week. That kind of faith and that kind of confidence, that kind of connectedness with God grows out of a daily communing with God. Amen. So Nebuchadnezzar said, I know what's wrong here. You fellas need a little help. So I'm going to help you out. Heat up the furnace seven more times, hotter. You need a little incentive. I'm going to help you out. Yeah. Here's my answer. I'm listening to the Hebrew boys. I'm listening in on the conversation. So here's what I think they're saying. Well, okay. <laughs> you got it all wrong, king. You are saying, if we don't bow, we're going to burn. King, you've got it all wrong. You've got dyslexia. Because if we bow, we're going to burn. Oh, king, you've got it all wrong. You see, God has another furnace that's coming at the end of the world that's hotter than anything you can come up with. So if we've got to choose furnaces, we're going to choose yours. <laughs> Hallelujah! The Bible tells us the king is now upset. He's upset. Why? He's upset because he knows what they're saying is true. But his pride has been hurt. The Bible tells us they heated up the furnace seven times hotter. I've heard some preachers in flights of fantasy says, well, God came down with a hallelujah fan and took the heat out of the furnace. <laughs> so when the three young men were thrown in there, the heat was gone. It sounds good, but it's not true. Because the men who threw them into the furnace were consumed by the heat. So what happened? God didn't take the heat out of the furnace. What God did was to fireproof those boys. Oh, God could have kept them out of the furnace. We sometimes wonder why it is that we fall into trials, why sickness comes, why unemployment comes, why our children walk away, why our spouses act crazy. Oh, don't be doing that now. I'm watching you. <laughs> don't be doing that. Got my eye on you. God allows trials to come into our lives so that he can test us. We have to be tested in order to be trusted. Yeah. Abraham, take that boy and go three days. Why three days? Because God wanted him to have every opportunity to turn back. And you notice something about this story, right? You know what's a good part of this story? Abraham didn't ask Sarah's permission. <laughs> Had Sarah gotten wind of what Abraham was up to? She would have been the one wheeling that knife on him. <laughs> You're not taking my boy. They bound him hand and foot, threw him in the fire. I heard a preacher friend of mine explain it this way. <laughs> he says, whatever is happening down here to God's people, God is taking note in heaven. <laughs> He's using his sanctified imagination. And he said, God, the Father called a meeting in heaven, and he says, listen, you know, the Bible talks about angels. Some have two wings, some have four wings, some have six wings. And he said to the angels with two wings, he said, my boy's down there in trouble. I need somebody to go down. How long would it take you? The angels with two wings says three minutes. The father says too long. He called the angels with four wings. He said, how long would it take you to get down there? And they said, well, father, two minutes. The father said, too long. Called the angels with six wings. He said, how long will it take you to get down there? My servants are in trouble. They said, Father, one minute. Father said, too long. 
So he looked over there and saw the sun. And he said, son, my boys are in trouble down there. How long will it take you to get down there? He said, father, I'm already down there. We need him. The Bible says while we are calling on him, the prayer has already been answered. You know what I like about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They threw him in. And here they got up and are walking around in the fire. And they're singing. You don't know that they're saying? They're singing. What are they singing? Oh, how I love Jesus. In the fire. And the singing must have been so sweet that Jesus chose to take the, the trio and make it a quartet. <laughs> he joined in with them. In the fire. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. My brothers and sisters, if we are going to stand up and be counted, let's be real clear tonight. God is not going to prevent us from being thrown into some fiery furnaces. <laughs> you know, I often hear people, Justin, I often hear people say, why me? And you know my response to them is, why not you? <laughs> I have not read an exemption clause in the contract. <laughs> the last time I read the contract, it says, all that live godly in Christ, help me with it, what does it say? Will suffer persecution. And sometimes the persecution doesn't come from Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> sometimes it's a lot closer home. Sometimes the persecution comes from the church that you're part of. Sometimes the persecution comes from friends that you thought. So they're in the fire. And the Bible tells us there's a fourth person that comes and joins them in the fire. I would have loved to have been there to see Nebuchadnezzar's face. Can't you not see him now? Did not we cast in three? One, two, three. Three, two, one. Uh. But I see four. Stand. Stand up and be counted. The Bible tells us, and Jesus promises, they that honor me. I will honor. When we stand up for him, he stands up with us. This is something I learned in seminary, Justin. You, you, you may have learned it already, but if not, it's coming. Dr. Davidson, one of my favorite teachers, Richard Davidson, great godly man. Helping us young fledgling theologians to understand the difference between the Western mindset and the Hebrew mind. Here's what the Western mind says, which all of us have been sort of, a, you know, partakers of. I must understand, then I'll do. The Hebrew mind says, I will do, and then I will understand. It's quite a different way of looking at the world. But if we are people of faith, we will be willing to trust God and believe in God. So here's what God says. Stand. And when we stand, he empowers us and enables us to withstand. And by and by, we will understand. There's a whole lot that God is not going to explain to us now. God didn't call us to understand. He called us to obey to trust, to believe, to rest in him. Well, I'm not going to do that until I understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you know what? There's a whole lot of things that don't make sense to me, but it's still real. Because I don't understand how a black cow eats green grass and produces white milk. <laughs> I don't understand, but it's real. There's a whole lot of things that we don't understand. You get sick, you go to a man that you don't know. He sends you down the road to a store, to the chemist, with some things scribbled on a piece of paper that you can't read. He goes in the back, puts some stuff in a bottle, tells you, go home and take it three times a day, and you do it. 
But yet when it comes to God, <laughs> I don't understand that. That don't make any sense to me. Hello. <laughs> Amen. Amen. How did they do it? How did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do what today seems to be impossible and incredible? Let me suggest three things. Number one, first of all, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were committed to God's purpose. When we live our lives committed to God's purpose, we don't have to understand everything that happens to us because everything that happens to us is not about us. Yeah. Joseph spent many years in jail only to find out and discover and discern it really wasn't about him. God sent him there to prepare a way for God's people. Paul and Silas thrown in jail. It wasn't about them. There was a jailer who wouldn't come to witness. So God sent Paul and Silas in there. Hello, are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Committed to God's purpose. That's the first thing. Live our lives committed to God's purpose. Secondly, live our lives conscious of God's presence. When we are conscious of God's presence, fear is gone. Man, when I was a little fella, I'd fight anybody. I don't care how big you were. I'm willing to fight anybody as long as my older brother was close by. My awareness of his presence gave me a confidence and a boldness that I would not otherwise have. When we live our lives committed to God's purpose and conscious of God's presence, doesn't the Bible say, if God be for us, who? Bring it on, devil. Who can be against us? Conscious of God's presence. And the third thing is connected to God's power. You know, most people in life live their lives trying to make connections. You know, connection, because connections get you a job. Connections get you promotion. Connections get you into places that otherwise. But you know what I've discovered? That not everybody with connections is connected. I'm talking about being connected to God's power. A few years ago, before all the smartphones and all these things, you know, we had those cordless phones, you know. And, and so I went out and bought one. And like most men, you know, I started to try to get this thing to operate by myself. So two hours into the project, and I'm not getting anywhere, I had a brilliant thought. Read the instructions. <laughs> yeah. So I got the box, and I, you know, I had crumbled up the instructions and throw it away, so I got it, and I opened it up, and I, you know, smoothed it out, and here's what the instruction says. Before this phone can be used, it must be charged. <laughs> okay, brilliant thought. Brilliant thought. I kept on reading, and here's what the instructions said. In order for this phone to operate at its maximum capacity, the handset can only go so far away from the base. Hmm. Yeah. I kept reading, and here's what it says. In order for this phone to continue to operate at maximum capacity, 
the handset must make frequent contact with the base. But here's what I discovered. <laughs> there are times when you put the phone on the base and you think it's making contact. <laughs> it's not. But here's how you know that it's making contact. When the handset makes proper contact with the base, a little light goes on. When you and I have made proper contact with God, the light of the glory of Jesus Christ shines forth Amen. from our countenance. People will know that we have been with Jesus. The Bible tells us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fiery furnace. And you know, the, you know I, I like the way God, you know, my God is a God of sense of humor. And he likes to brag on us every so often. He, he gives us little details that, you know, we sometimes miss. But one of them says, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, God even took away the smell of smoke from their garments. You see, when we encounter Christ and surrender to him, he removes all of the stench and the smell of where we have been so that we are now new creatures in Christ. Stand up and be counted. How do we do that? Committed to God's power. Committed to God's purpose. Live conscious of his presence. Live connected to his power. Many years ago, I came across a story. I like stories. I came across a story about a little fella. This little fella loved to read Western novels. He had a particular author that he had grown to love. And so one day he was upstairs in his room, and his dad was downstairs in the other room, and he kept hearing his little boy saying, if you only knew what I know, over and over and over again. So he became concerned. He thought maybe the little fellow had read too many novels and was losing it. So he went upstairs, he knocked on the door, and he said, son, what's going on in here? He said, dad, I was reading about my favorite author. And in my favorite author, there was a favorite hero of mine called the sheriff and every time the bad guys would come into town the sheriff would put on his guns and get on his horse and he would chase the outlaws out of town he said but dad I was reading this one story and it seems as though one day this outlaw came into town and my hero the sheriff tried as he would he couldn't chase the outlaw out of town he said dad I became so discouraged I was about to throw the book away and give up on my hero he said then I had a thought and the thought says, go to the back of the book and see how the story ends. <laughs> he said, Dad, I went to the back of the book and lo and behold, I discovered that one day my hero, the sheriff, got the courage. And he chased the outlaw out of town. So he said, Dad, I went back to the place in the story where the outlaw is walking around the town like he owns it. And I kept saying to the outlaw, if you only knew what I know. My brothers and sisters, tonight, I want to tell you something. There is an outlaw running loose in this world. And he acts like he owns the world. He causes strife and chaos and confusion in our homes, in our families, in our personal lives. Oh, but before you get this courage and throw away your hero, go to the back of the book. And John says that I saw them standing on the sea of glass, a number that could not be numbered from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people singing the song of Moses. Go to the back of the book and you will discover a city coming down from God with all of the saints of God within the city. Tonight... The good news for us is that we know how this story is going to end. We know that no matter how difficult and daunting the journey is, that God has already decreed in the end. The story ends with two words. He won. That's it. 
Jesus won. And when we put our faith and trust and confidence in him, we too shall win. Stand up. Stand up and be counted as one who loves God, as one who fears God, as one who is waiting to see him when he comes. As a musician comes and plays softly for us tonight, there are some of you here tonight who have been attending these conferences. You may have come here with questions and concerns, anxieties and fears, but tonight Jesus is speaking to your heart and he's saying to you, it's time for you to stand up and be counted.